This is uh, Paul Campbell, um, and this is 21st of April, 2021. Um, we're here today at the Mobile Arts Council Gallery down from the Sanger, just down the street from the Sanger. We're surrounded by an exhibit by A. Partridge, and the exhibit is entitled Alabama Astronaut, the Folk Art of A. Partridge. It's up through the end of the month. And there are pieces for sale, so hurry on down and, and check out this exhibit while it's still up. And this is being produced by the University of South Alabama's uh, Library's Art Gallery. Um, this is the, the Artist of the Week, featuring Abe Partridge. Um, I'd like to start this out with a quote from uh, a writer in Atlanta, uh, Tony Paris, who's a writer with Creative Loafing Magazine, um, in which he talks about, really talks about Abe's work as a musician, but I think it's just as applicable to his art. And the quote is, Abe Partridge rips out his, rips his heart out and shows it to you. And surrounded by all this artwork, I think you'd have to agree that that this is a, an exhibit where a man has ripped out his heart. He's showing you um, his, a very honest interpretation of what is in his heart. Um, now, folks that have attended his concerts are familiar with his life story as he introduces particular songs with a short story. And so if we could start out with how, uh, if you could quickly tell us how uh, your your life story and how it has led to you becoming a folk artist. Okay. Well, I uh, I left Mobile when I was 18 and uh, in pursuit of a theological education. And I ended up uh, going to four Bible colleges in four years and then... I graduated, and the day late, uh, the, the day after I graduated, I married my wife Kathy, who I'd met in Bible college, and we lived in Northwest Georgia, where I served at a at a at a um at an in independent fundamental Baptist church, and uh, we started having babies. And when I was 25, I moved up to uh, Middlesboro, Kentucky, and I started pastoring a church there. And uh, a couple years into it, I um, realized that that's no longer what I was wanting to do, and uh, which led to a, a internal uh, dilemma that ended up leading me to start writing songs and creating art uh, as a way of working myself through it. And I eventually left. Uh, I quit the ministry and I left the church and moved back to Mobile with my wife and my children and everything I owned in a U-Haul trailer. And I moved into my mama's house out in West Mobile and uh, I worked I started working at a minimum wage job up until I joined the military so I could learn a marketable skill, you know, because uh, that the theology agreed I had didn't really mean nothing. And uh, so I, I joined the military and I went to, went to the desert in 2013 and 14. And when I was there, I had already been writing songs and painting pictures like these here. Uh, since about 2006, 2007, sometime around there. And um, I uh, I had determined when I was in the desert that when I got home, if, you know, I, if God would let me get home, that I would do my best to, to, to play my songs. And so I came home, and in October 2015, I ended up playing my first show at a songwriting co uh, contest. And... Uh, I ended up doing okay at it, and um, I started touring around and playing songs and ended up getting a record deal, and then that record deal led to me getting a manager and a publicist, and then one day they come to my house, and 
late 2017 and they saw a painting that I had on my wall and they said, who did that? And I said, I did it. And they said, well, you need to start showing your artwork too. So in February of 2018, I, I showed some of the art that I had been painting for over a decade, you know, and, um, then people started buying my art. So then, so I was basically touring around and playing songs and selling paintings. And then, um, I left my job in March of 2019 and, uh, I began doing it full time as a songwriter and an artist. Well, the pandemic has certainly halted a lot of artists, especially performing artists from making a living, but you're making a, a, a pretty good show of, of putting food on the table and, 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 uh, providing for your family through your artwork. Yeah. Um, and you have some different vehicles for that you use for doing that. You got the things like the Alabama astronaut art club. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about those different yeah. methods that you're using? Yeah. So when the pandemic, uh, occurred in the beginning of 2020, I was only about a year into being a full-time artist and songwriter. The bulk of my income that I needed to provide for my family um, came from playing shows on the road and touring. And so, obviously, uh, that was something that, that went away in October of, uh, or excuse me, in, at the beginning of 2020 when the pandemic occurred. So I had to rethink uh, how it was that, I brought in money, you know, <laughs> and, uh, I mean, uh, unfortunately that's the one word, you know, any artist just, uh, it puts a bad feeling that, you know, as soon as you say money, I didn't start painting any of this stuff to make money, nor did I ever write a song to make money. But then whenever things grew to the point to where that became the, what I did with my life, well, I mean, money's just a part of it. So I was afraid. Um, I mean, honestly, I was afraid in April, March and April of 2020. Uh, as the news started coming around that that this thing was probably going to last a little bit longer than a few weeks, I got, I got pretty nervous. And uh, me and Kathy talked about, uh, we argued over which one of us was going to go to work. I was like, I'm going to go to work. She's like, no, I'm going to go to work. And, uh, Finally, it occurred to me that um, that I should I should start an art club, and uh, I figured, hey, you know, if we start an art club and got like thirty people that that would uh, be willing to join it, you know, that would pay one of our car notes, you know, and maybe 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 one of us just have to work part time, and uh, well, we we uh, we we put it we. You know, within like six or seven months, we 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 maxed it out. We had capped it at a hundred members, so we have a hundred people in the art club now that that uh that that pay twenty nine dollars a month in exchange. Uh, me, I, I paint a piece of art for specifically for that club every month, and um, we make a hundred prints and we sign them. I, I sign them and number all of them. And then we also like put something extra in. I've given out like live, live recordings and, and, uh, stickers and magnets and just all different kind of stuff. But that, which is, which is awesome to me because I, I like to be able to, um, now every month I have to create something. And, uh, so it's like kept me creative. And, uh, and, and it also like there's, um, there's, this is something I never even had when I was on the road. I never had like a m monthly amount of money that I was going to be making. You know, it was always like go on the road, make as much money as you can, come home, pay the bills. Hopefully you got a little bit left over. Well, now, you know, we have, we have like a consistent um, income from the art club. So, I mean, the pandemic has been terrible for the world. But, uh, for me, not the pandemic, but the opportunity to, to be able to re to have to rethink what it is and that you do and how you do it has been a, a real blessing for me. 
Well, let's talk about your art, but let's talk about how you okay. actually create these pieces. Um, you sort of have a, a unique labor-intensive method for yeah. preparing your work and whether it's you know, a three-dimensional object or just a wall, piece of wall art or one of these records or, or that. Can you tell us about the, your, your technical yeah. application of all these materials from beginning to end? Yeah, so I basically I, get, I, I buy that roofing tar. And um, I buy roofing tar at the Lowe's or the Home Depot, whichever one has it on sale. And then I just, uh, if I'm, I paint on, you know, most of my stuff is just paint, just, just spread over wood. But then, you know, sometimes I have ideas and I paint other stuff too, you know, I paint what you gave me some birdhouses and uh, I painted, I, I tarred one of them up. I tar records up, you know, I tar, I just, anything I'm going to paint, I usually will put a layer of tar on it. And, uh, the tar, what it does. And then, so after I tar it, then I have to let it harden a cure or whatever you call it over. Usually it takes, it, it takes at least a month, but if you wait about three months, it's even better, you know, but, um, then I, I paint, I carve, I carve everything into the tar. And that's what gives it a dimensional uh, look. Even the stuff that's painted on board, if you look at it, it you know, it has hills and valleys and stuff, you know. And um, that's and I, I paint with acrylics, and uh, that's that's pretty much it. It's just tar and acrylics, and then I put like that a uh, clear coat over top of everything. And that and that kind of seals it in, and I don't know, makes it a little shiny. Yeah. Um, do you also do some sort of non-traditional things? Um, you you paint on uh, media that hangs on the wall. You do th three-dimensional objects. You know, there's a buck dancer over there that's really cool yeah, that you've yeah. done. Uh, the birdhouse that you mentioned. Yeah. Um, but you have some inner uh, interactive art. Yeah. which is really, really different, I think. And it's, you know, I, I watch people um, be drawn to these pieces. Um, they're really some of my favorites. Uh, can you describe some of those? Well, you know, sometimes I have ideas about things. And uh, I like to go to junk stores and flea markets and thrift stores and stuff. And I'll just walk around and look. And sometimes I'll see objects that... Uh, that I'm that I can see could be turned into an uh, interactive piece of art. I'll buy them, like that little thing over there. It's one of those little shadow boxes, you know. And it, it was like some little 1970s shadow box, and and uh, so I tarred it up and I made it where it's like, um, and then we installed a uh, we installed a black light in it, to where you could turn the black light on and the devil. I put the devil in there looking through. It's like the devil's looking through the window at you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah and you can turn on the black light and see him glow in there i painted him a black light paint and then i've got other things where i've taken apart synthesizers and uh and used like a uh made a musical i've i've put guitar strings on some of my paintings like to where you like on the tongues i, I use tongues a lot and I've I've put I made a lot of paintings where you could put the tongue I uh, put a guitar string on their tongue to where you could you could make your painting talk you know and and uh, you put a little uh, a, a brass slide or a glass bottle on there and you can make them sing you know you can change the inflections or whatever through, the, through that guitar string I've electrified them or you can um, you can plug the the painting into a guitar amp and play the painting. Uh, I've got some where I, I've got one where I took apart a loop pedal and uh, basically installed the loop pedal in the back of the painting to where um, the guy will sing on a loop. And then I've added a pitch in there to where you can make the pitch up. I don't know, Paul. Just, I, you know, sometimes things jump out at me and I just make them. And uh, I don't really intend on making them. I just find stuff. And then, the, then when I find stuff, it like makes an idea, you know. There, there's certainly more than just art. I mean, they're, they're personal amusement. 
too. One of my favorites is on the wall over there. This is a new thing that you've done. It's yeah. a chicken chasing chicken, children chasing yeah. Yeah. a chicken. <laughs> yeah. it's, a, it's a globe. If you can just describe that. Yeah, it's, what it it's was. It's one piece that everybody should just come and, and see. I mean, it's, it's worth coming to see this one piece, I uh, think. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, so I was walking down through the Mobile Flea Market one day, and somebody had taken out a globe, and you know how usually the globe will sit into a stand on its axis? Well, somebody had – it was broke, and so somebody had taken out and just set it on top to where it, it moved laterally. And I looked at that and I was like, man, that could be a killer painting. And so I bought that little globe, that broke globe for like a dollar or two dollars or whatever. And I took it home and I, and I made a painting on it of a bunch of kids chasing each other. And, um, and I put, uh, after I finished it, I put it online and people, er, there was a lot of people wanted it. And so I was like, well, I got to go. I went on eBay and I found as many globes as I could that looked just like that one, and I, and I bought them. <laughs> so I bought four of them, and that was one of them over there. But, yeah, that's one. So so basically, uh, and then Kathy, my wife, she mounted it all on there with glue and screws and stuff and made the back. And, and uh, so you can, you can spin the globe. With it. Now it's just a ball, but you can spin it, and you can see little children chasing a chicken. And the and the words around it say, you know, little children chasing a chicken can quickly turn into a chicken chasing little children. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, um, your art it, it it's it's really it's sort of complex. There's a lot of complexity in your art, and one thing I think I sort of wish there was a guide to that was on the wall every time I see your a collection of your work somewhere you include a tremendous amount of symbolism yeah. in your art yeah and there are things like uh snakes and candles and flowers and little demons and mm -hmm. uh long tongues you got a lot of really long tongues that, yeah. that usually have something appended to it yeah that yeah. that that illustrates something about the person that you're you're depicting in the piece of art. Can yeah. you explain some of these symbols? Well, you know, I think a lot, a lot of them should be should be pretty self-explanatory. But I mean, the tongue, the tongue is that's all. You know, that's out the New Testament. So, uh, you know, or uh, you know, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speak speaketh. You know, so it's like if you want to know what kind of person somebody is, you just listen to them. And, uh, so, and, and you know, it's just like what comes out of, what comes out of somebody. So if you just see a paint of somebody with their mouth closed, sometimes you have to do a little reading into it. But if you see their tongue out and you see flowers on it, you can tell it's, you know, it's like, it's, it's symbolic of like beauty, right? Beauty coming out of somebody. And then like, uh, candles, you know, it's like light. And uh, enlightenment, you know, and of course snakes are scary, and uh, and you know uh, I think that's something born into us, and um, and representative of evil a lot of times, you know, and uh, you know like, but uh, and so yeah, I, I use symbolism to try to depict uh, those kind of things. Uh, to tell a story, really. It's just like my songs, you know. I try to tell stories in my songs. And I try to tell stories with my paintings, too. It might not be a very complex story, but, you know, a story nonetheless. Uh, so two two or so weeks ago when this exhibit opened, um, at the opening, I was watching people and I had a conversation with a fella about your use of Indians and cowboys that sort of it's sort of a different arena from a lot of the the other paintings that you do uh, wh what is it about cowboys and American oh. Indians that is special to you well you know when I was a, 
I guess when I was a kid, I was obsessed with Westerns. You know, I loved Western, which is odd for a little child, but my favorite TV shows and movies and all that were always old Westerns. And, uh, I, I love the, I love the, uh, the, I love the, the Western apparel, you know, the shirts and the, the hats and, uh, and the same thing with the, you know, the Native Americans. And, uh, I'm just, I've always been drawn to the imagery of, of that, of, of all those, of, you know, those people. Well, like I said, I've, I've watched people as they, they look at your art and interpret it and seem to get into it. And, um, people are, people walk up to them and, and, are really intrigued with them, but there's one that, that people sort of, they approach it very differently. Um, I've noticed this over and over, but you've got, if you could tell us the story or what is, what you, what is behind the creation of the piece that is a mannequin, which is illustrative oh, yeah. of the story of Legion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I bought a mannequin at J.C. Penney because they were going out of business, and uh, I was like, "Man, that'd be a great card work." And so I was saying, I, I sat on it for a while. I just got the mannequin, but I couldn't figure out what to do with it. And then, um, you know, I read that story of the boy that was in the cemetery, and Jesus took all the devils out of him, put him in a bunch of pigs, and the pigs ran off the cliff. And um, that's what I painted. <laughs> I painted this. I basically painted a painted a boy being delivered from all these devils that inhabited him. And so on his face, there's a cross, and there's a rainbow, which is you know the colors of the rainbow is just fragmented light. So. Uh, and he's coming out, you know, and he's got gold on his head and it's dripping down in the back. And he's, he's, he's being delivered from, from the bondage of those devils that had inhabited him. Yeah, but people look at my art, uh, and, but this is the same way it happens with my songs too, Paul. Either some people either get it and they like it, or some people are like, that guy's crazy. <laughs> or some people look at my stuff or they hear my songs and they're and and they have like a visceral negative reaction to it and they don't want to have anything to do with it and uh but that's that's fine by me you know and i and i don't criticize anybody for uh for any of those reactions if you see my art <clears throat> if you see my art or hear my songs and you like it that's awesome and if you see my if if you hear my see my art and hear my songs and you think that they're 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 horrible that's okay too you know there's plenty of art and artists in the world and i'm sure you can find something you like <laughs> yeah. yeah i've been to concerts where performances of yours where people did walk out people will walk and, out at times yeah. <laughs> and so um folks you gotta understand this this art really does stir some emotions and uh whether you accept it or not you know the fact that they stir emotions make them something special to yeah. most people who really do try to understand them. Yeah. And if you don't want that, then I mean, just go to Hobby Lobby and look, <laughs> you know, look around on the shelves and you, you know, you can, you will be happy and that's fine too. I'm not criticizing that. You know, it's just, it's the nature. I, I, I have come to terms and I, and I've accepted that over through a long process you know, because initially when, you know, I first started showing my art, I was like, uh, I mean, I never thought anybody was going to get it to begin with, but, uh, but, you know, negative reactions kind of, I was like, well, I don't, I don't understand. And, but, um, oh man, there's been so many of them now. I've just come to accept it and, and, and I'm okay with it. And one thing that you do that I really like, you have a lot of tributes to different individuals and, and the majority of them are, or uh, musicians, performers. Um, I mean, there's just a whole lot of these that you've created. Um, every, anything from uh, Bruce Hampton. Um, I don't know. Can you 
talk about a few of those? Oh, yeah. There, I mean, there's a bunch of them right here. Howlin' Wolf, uh, the Stanley Brothers, the Beatles, Bob Dylan, the Red. Look, look at old Flea there. He, he's got a gap in his teeth. <laughs> Jimi Hendrix, you know, I mean, yeah, I, I, uh, I've always been a fan of rock and roll music, the blues, country music. I mean, just a music connoisseur in general, you know. And um, I started painting records, and you know, sometimes I paint paint them just on boards as well. But uh, I try to, um, yeah, they're just kind of like, um, uh, it's all out of appreciation for for their work. Yeah. I think anybody can find some artist that they can identify with. Uh, you know, I've got one that um, it's uh, Sid Vicious and Sid and Nancy. Yeah, that was and one of the that, that was an early one. Yeah, yeah, it's just reminiscent of a time in my life when I moved to Atlanta and the Sex Pistols. Yeah, were, arrived really the, about the same week that I did in oh, Atlanta, cool. and um, so it's it's really one of my favorites. Um, you know, my I, friend I didn't actually get to see them, but yeah, um, it's just an interesting time in my life that I get to reflect back on because I own that one. Yeah. So <laughs> my friend, uh, Rick Diamond is, he's also one of my biggest, uh, he's a photographer, but also one of my biggest patrons to my art and everything. And, and, uh, he was the photographer at that first show that the Sex Pistols played in Atlanta, which I was, was if I'm not mistaken, was their first show in the United States. Yes. And, and, and I've got some of the original, like, photographs from there. I got one hanging on my house with, like, Sid Vicious and Johnny Rotten. <laughs> it's pretty awesome, man. So, if you were to look at all your art, is there, is there one particular painting? I know you've got some that are special. It's, you got one or two that are really special to, to your wife, yeah. Kathy. Is, yeah. there, is there one that's like sort of stands out or is it a series or, or something that stands out that it's just like, that's the one that, that I have to keep forever. I mean, is that, um, well, you know, the very first one that I ever painted, uh, in, in the style that I currently utilize when I first started painting, I just went to Walmart and bought one of them little canvas things, you know, and I, I don't know what even happened to them things. They probably all got thrown away. But um, the the first painting I painted in this style, I, I had only been back in Mobile for about a week or so after leaving the church in, in Kentucky. And um, I'd sprawled a bunch of tar over this paint. And I didn't know back then. I did I you know I learned all this as a go but I I just put I put tar on there threw paint on it immediately and got all tar all over my hands it was all over me and uh and I painted and I painted Sunhouse and uh I had fell in love with the blues uh, the bluesman Sunhouse you know he was a he was a Baptist preacher who became a bluesman instead of a bluesman that became a Baptist preacher which you think that would be the normal you know, you're, you know, you're a young kid, you're a bluesman. And then as you get older, you know, you find, find the Lord and you become a preacher. Well, son house was a kid started out as a preacher and then he, uh, found the blues. And, uh, I'd always love son house and everything. So that was the first painting I ever made. And I painted and I inscribed the words to it, to the, uh, to the, uh, preaching the blues, which was which was one of his uh, songs and the the first words of it I believe I'm going I'm going to get me religion I'm going to join the Baptist church I'm going to be a Baptist preacher so I won't have to work <laughs> <laughs> and so Kathy won't let me get rid of that one so that one's still in my house and... okay so yeah that that would probably be the one okay so I think to if we could um, it's about time to wrap this up unless there's some questions that come in from outside. Um, just sort of like you're, you're, uh, you really, I don't know that you really fit in the niche just as a regular folk artist, but, um, or an outsider artist or, or whatever. Um, it's definitely folk art. Um, it, but there's some, there's some personalities out there that are, are already past, um, St. Ohm, um, Eddie Owen, 
Murphy, um, other artists like Howard Finster, um, that we get to we get to look at their art um, now that they're gone and interpret it and and talk about it and talk about how it affects us. And so looking down the road for your art, um, what would you be curious for people to um, to interpret your art as or uh, what would your artistic legacy be that you would be curious to know how people in the future define your art? I have, that is something I've never considered, Paul. I mean, I've, uh, I'm still blown away that people, uh, I'm blown away that the mobile arts council think this stuff is good enough to put up in here. And, uh, I'm just, I'm every time somebody buys a piece of art, there's still a, there's still that part of me that's just like, wow, I can't believe that just happened, you know, because, um, and as far as some, you know, in the future, I, I would hope that I would hope that somebody's still looking at my stuff in the future. Uh, and as far as the interpretation goes, I'm okay with, cause like all I do is make and then the, the other, you know, arts like communication. And so your interpretation of my painting, even if it's, I've had people say, Hey man, this painting is amazing. And it means so much to me because of this. And they'll tell me a story that I don't even know how they derive that from the painting that I made. But I'm just like, cool, you know, even if even because if I paint something with a certain intention and you misinterpret that tension, but your interpretation of of that moves you. Well, I mean, that's wonderful to me. So I don't really care how it's interpreted. I, 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 I care that it's still being interpreted. That would be pretty cool after I'm gone if somebody still likes this stuff. But um as far as how they're interpreted, I would just be thrilled to know that they're interpreting it at all. <laughs> all right. As the pandemic lifts, well, I have been engaged in a super secret project that has lasted for the past uh, nine months or so that I am working to bring to fruition in time uh but i'll uh and then other than that i've got a couple i've actually got two records and an ep worth of material the songs that i plan on releasing as soon as i'm able to get on the road and tour them again so uh hopefully that'll happen sooner than later but you know I'm not chomping at the bits to get out there early. Uh, people are still coming out of this, you know, they're in there. People still have varying uh, degrees of comfort with going out and doing that kind of stuff. So. All right, folks, this is, this sort of draws to the end of the interview with Abe Partridge. Um, we'd, and we'd like to thank mobile arts council, the mobile arts council gallery um, on Joachim street. Um, just down from the Sanger for hosting this exhibit. As I said, it's open for just a few more days through next Sunday, I believe. Um, hurry on down and see it. Um, and also, um, again, this um, interview is produced by the um, University of South Alabama Libraries Art Gallery. Thank you all very much.